Committee, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. But first, because otherwise I will forget it, um, I'm going to tell you about next week's program. And next week we have something on climate change, the Vermont perspective. Um, the speaker is a professor and scientist named Gil Jillian Galford. And she is the lead author of the Vermont Climate Assessment. So she's going to review our future climate in Vermont and the impacts on communities, natural resources, agriculture, and tourism. It will be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so today's speaker uh, completes a dynasty of speakers. <laughs> I do believe that the Graff family is the only family that has will have had four members speak. Um, I think many of you know Chris Graff. We're not going to make a big deal about anybody because she's an important person. And her mother Nancy and her brother Garrett. Um, that is the end, except that Garrett does have a baby. <laughs> so maybe 20 years from now I will be standing here introducing his baby. So. The other members of the Graff family are writers and reporters and investigative journalists and that sort of thing. But Lindsay branched out. Um, and although she grew up in Montpelier and then Lark, Vermont, she always wanted to be a marine biologist. Always. And she got her undergraduate and graduate degrees in marine biology and shark biology and for the past 10 years has worked with sharks around the world. Um, her journeys have taken her to South Africa and the Bahamas and quite often to Fiji. It's been really hard on her. <laughs> In the summers, she's been working on the Cape. And I think a lot of you have, have read about how the great white sharks are coming back to the Cape. And Lindsay has been one of the prime researchers in that project. So she is here to tell us about that today. Lindsay Graff. or reemergence of gray white sharks in New England, which is fascinating to begin with. But it also, we're going to talk about why it should be celebrated instead of essentially scaring people off in New England or swimming. You can always swim in Lake Champlain, but I would say <laughs> after this lecture, you might learn a few tips on where you shouldn't swim around Cape Cod or other parts of New England. And I don't think it's a bad thing, and what you're going to learn from talk is you're going to see that it's a really wonderful thing and that we actually have a very healthy ocean right now. You got a little closer to the light, please. Yes. Thank you. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, so clearly everyone here from Vermont, when I talk to other people around the world and they ask where I'm from, I think most of them assume I'm going to say California or Florida. And a lot of people don't actually know where Vermont is when they say it's Fiji or South Africa. Um, I know that there is one other female shark biologist. She's currently doing her undergrad right now. Um, but that would make a total of two of us who focus on sharks and who are born and raised Vermonters. Usually when we say New England, we think of the cows, Ben and Jerry's, lovely craft beers, foliage. Um, any kind of marine animal normally would bring up. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> references to Champ, um, and whatever else might be lurking in Lake Champlain. That is a whole other world that we still need to keep discovering about. But in the last few years, it's possible this doesn't work that well. A little bit more time has been spent looking at the sharks that are in New England. This is a disservice, though, because in New England, we're actually blessed with over 33 species of sharks in our waters naturally. So these are sharks that have always been here, but a lot of these species are pelagic, which means they live offshore in deep waters. You wouldn't normally see these sharks unless you're fishing very far out there on the banks, maybe doing a little scuba diving close to the Gulf Stream. But what we have in New England is we have the world's second largest shark, the basking shark, which you can actually very regularly see in New England waters. Um, second largest shark, but they eat plankton. And the problem with basking sharks and great white sharks is that a lot of people actually misidentify basking sharks as great white sharks. Basking sharks can go up to 30 feet in length. So if we ever have someone call us and say, I just saw a great white shark that was double the size of my skiff. They're actually probably seeing a basking shark. So we've had a lot of misidentifications happen, which then it tends to blow up around the news very easily. Um, photos of sharks chasing kayakers when really they're just harmless basking sharks. They're called basking because they simply bask at the surface. And they swim around with their mouths wide open, essentially eating nonstop the plankton that's located right in the top. We do also have beautiful pelagic sharks like the blue sharks. We have the short fin mako, the world's fastest fish, can swim up to 45 miles per hour, and that's simply to help it catch its prey, like swordfish and tuna and bluefish that can swim just as fast. We have sand tigers, we have thresher sharks, and closer to shore, we have the spiny dogfish seen right here. And that's actually one of the only fish that you can commercially fish. Um, while all of these other sharks are normally found pretty far offshore, the spiny dogfish is found close to shore, but it's a demersal fish, so that means it's found on the bottom of the ocean floor. Um, if you are someone who travels to Europe a lot and eats fish and chips, what you are most likely eating is actually the spiny dogfish. It's a very cheap white fish, and most of it, which you can see at like the Chatham Fish Pier and Cape Cod or those areas, are being sent to Europe to be used for cheap fish and chips there. So a lot of people say, oh, the great white shark we have in New England. We are actually plentiful with the sharks in New England. You just don't see them that often. And we're going to talk about why the great white shark is more visible than these other species in just a minute. So this is a video taken from our research vessel. Just a little welcome to the great white shark part of the talk. It might be a little loud, it's just underwater sounds. And it's taking a GoPro on a very long stick. Nosset Beach in Cape Cod in Orleans. And that is what we're going to be focusing on. Even though we do have 33 species of sharks in England, we're going to be focusing on the great white shark today. So the thing about the great white shark population is people are saying it's a brand new population. And it's actually a misnomer because this is a re-emerging population. We know for a fact that great white sharks have always been around the Northwest Atlantic. Um, and we know just because of fishing records, and actually the first shark attack, it wasn't fatal, but was in 1771. So although there were scientists taking a lot of data, there were records of any shark bites or shark attacks. And the famous shark attacks of 1916 was actually what inspired Peter Benchley to write Jaws. So we know even back in 1916, there were a lot of great white sharks in the New England area. Um, 
However, we just didn't have the science available to us, or essentially any way to collect data on these beautiful animals. So there's nothing known about these sharks until recently. Uh, we do have a few old kind of news clips, and the person up in the left-hand corner, that is Frank Mundus, and he is the famous shark fisherman or shark killer of Montauk. And you're gonna see a video clip of him catching the world's largest great white shark, which he caught in the date somewhere, August 6th, and he had to go 80 miles offshore just to even find them. What he did was he went 80 miles offshore and he found a dead whale. And around that whale, he stuck there for a few days, there were about six great white sharks, and he reeled one in using a handheld reel, and then came back and displayed it. And it was Frank Mundus that Peter Benchley used to kind of create Quint in Jaws. Um, the really interesting thing about Frank Mundus, though, is because all of his popularity for killing great white sharks caused an increase of people to go out and kill great white sharks themselves. And just like Peter Benchley, later in life, he became a shark conservation advocate. And essentially, through education and outreach, he learned that because he was killing all of these beautiful, old sharks, they weren't able to reproduce and repopulate. Um, just like humans, sharks are actually case-selected. So it means they grow very slowly, they only have a few young, and it takes them a very long time to reach maturity. So a lot, essentially if you're catching the largest sharks out there, you're catching these female sharks who can no longer repopulate. And if you continually catch these large sharks, the population is gonna lose its size, and it's gonna lose its numbers. So here's a clip of Frank Mundus catching the world's largest great white shark. Veteran shark killer Captain Frank Mundus and his friend Don Braddock have done it again, this time reeling in what is being called a world record. At around midnight, the two Long Island fishermen brought in a great white shark weighing more than 3,000 pounds. News 55's Matt Sesney has the story. After nearly two days at sea, Montauk shark fishing king Frank Mundus returned early this morning with a world record catch, a 17 foot 3,500 pound great white shark. It's believed to be the largest great white ever caught with a rod and reel, literally shattering a 27 year record set in Australia by almost a thousand pounds. Veteran Montauk fisherman Don Braddock brought the shark in with Mundus in about two hours. Both, though, had staked out the shark for two days. I would, did I say, I'll never even see one this large again, but uh, I'm happy with it. You're sitting on top of the world. How does it feel? It's good. It's good. I like it. I needed, I needed this. It was 40 years to do it. The top of the world. And no, no higher. You can't go any higher. Just as amazed as Mundus and the other fishermen, though, were the onlookers, who had to see the Jaws-like creature to believe it. It's amazing. It's simply amazing. I'm not a fisherman either. Before well, you become a fisherman now? Yeah. <laughs> this woman behind my boat was, when I had as big as my boat, my boat was seven foot wide. He had his arm, seriously. He took off like oh, my sisters, let's catch my sisters, let's get the hell out of here. Now according to Captain Mundus, this great white was spotted some 30 miles south of Montauk, two days before it was landed, feeding off a dead whale. Now the amazing part is, according to Mundus, this was not the only shark out there at the time. According to him, they more or less had their choice of some six to eight great whites. That whale was only dead for 24 hours before we found it. So, I mean, when you really think about it, that's amazing. That, that we do have that many white sharks in this area. In Montauk, Matt Sesney News 55. So with what we know today, being able to age sharks, we know that that shark was um, a female between 50 and 80 years old. Mm -hmm. So essentially he was removing a very mature female from a dwindling population to begin with. Um, and it was those kinds of actions that really caused him to do a turnaround later in life and become a shark conservationist. It's not like other species of fish, so cartilaginous fish, like goldfish and that kind of stuff, repopulate a lot and they have a lot of babies because they have a very low survival rate. Sharks have only a few pups 
and they have a very high survival rate until you kind of add in commercial fishing, bycatch, or any kind of human interactions. So why do the great white sharks leave? We know that they used to be around New England, and then they kind of disappeared. And if you talk to older generations in Cape Cod, they'll say, I never saw any great white sharks in Cape Cod. They'll also say, I never saw any seals in Cape Cod. And that is why the great white sharks left. If you take away an apex predator's prey, you take away the predator too. Essentially in the 18th and 19th century, um, the number here, uh, the 19th and 20th century, 135,000 gray seals were systematically killed in, uh, from Massachusetts up to Maine. And if you cut off the snout of one of the gray seals and brought it in, you would get $5 for it. So they were being targeted for their pelts, for their fur, but also because fishermen believed that they were causing competition with the fish that they were going after. So for a lot of people in Cape Cod, they grew up without any seals in the area. But what they grew up in was a completely <coughs> unbalanced marine ecosystem. They took away all of the seals, and in 1965, there were only 30 gray seals remaining in Maine. So if you took away all of the prey, the great white sharks are going to leave. And right when kind of our marine biology um, resources were growing, when we were suddenly having the scientific abilities to be studying these animals, they didn't exist in New England. So even though populations in California and South Africa have really been studied for over 80 years and they know so much about them, we've only started studying this population in the last 10 years. Essentially what happened though, when all those gray seals were killed, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in 1972. And so that was kind of a broad protection to all marine mammals from whales to gray seals to harp seals in the area. And that allowed enough protection and also protection of the habitats where these seals were re reproducing for those populations to bounce back. And what we've learned in the last you know, 20, 30 years since this has happened is just how interconnected predator and prey and marine ecosystems are. If you want to protect an animal, you have to figure out what that animal eats. It will only thrive if it has a food source. So with these gray seals returning to New England, and now most of them are found actually between Monomoy and New Brunswick. Um, in 2017, there was an aerial survey that was done that spotted about 20,000 seals in Cape Cod. So they bounced back. And it's some people in the area, mostly the fishermen, will say that their populations are out of control. The way to control that population is to celebrate the great white sharks coming back. And with the resurgence of their favorite food coming back, you have the great white sharks coming back to New England. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first sighting of a great white shark officially in New England and in Massachusetts was September 23 in 2004 when a great white shark used a full moon and a high tide to get into a salt marsh pond. It was stuck there for 13 days and the person I worked for Greg Scomel was the first person to see the great white shark in the science community essentially in the last decade. He also was the first person to tag a great white shark ever in the Atlantic Ocean. However, after the shark was able to, was essentially escorted out of the salt pond back into the ocean, the tag fell off 45 minutes later. <laughs> so it wasn't until 2009 that a great white shark was successfully tagged. But with this sighting in, um, in Buzzers Bay in 2004, it was the first moment that Greg Skomel, who now is the great white shark expert of all of New England and the East Coast, realized that great white sharks might be back in the area. The only ones he had seen up until then were dead specimens that were brought to him by fishermen. So here's a video of the fisherman who was very surprised when he was fishing in that salt pond 
and saw a 13-foot great white shark, and then the resulting footage of it essentially going viral around the world, and people flocking to the salt pond for 13 days while the researchers were trying to study it too. And now over to Great White Shark Territory and Thing Zoo. <laughs> levels that they are susceptible when it comes to stress. Hammerheads are incredibly susceptible to stress, so even if you catch a hammerhead species on a fishing line and release it, 99% of those sharks will die within the next 24 hours. <laughs> Tiger sharks and great white sharks are a little bit more hardy, um, so they can deal with a little bit more stress than that, but you can see why the dangers of catch and release come into play when talking about sharks, and a lot of people will say, well, it swim away just fine. It might have, but 10 hours after that, 24 hours back, um, what they're finding at the University of Miami is that these sharks are dying at about a rate of 90% release rate. Um, so what you want to do, the shark was clearly already stressed. It was chasing after prey, and it found itself in an aquarium, almost. So that's why they were hoping to get it out. They finally got it out of the bay um, by actually using seine nets to corral it and push it towards the opening. Um, and the reason, it got in there essentially in a full moon and a high tide, which mean the tide was much higher than it normally is. So it needed that kind of extra push to be able to leave the salt pond. Um, but that was when they found out 45 minutes later that the tag detached. Mm. That was the first moment uh, in 2004, though, that researchers realized that great white sharks might actually be back in the area and not just being a fisherman's tail. It's not the end. There we go. So this is a little blurry and a little bloody. This is the return of the great white shark to England. Um, and this was taken by Wayne Davis, who is a professional aerial spotter. He used to work for tuna fishermen, and he would fly out there with the harpoon boats. And he would find the largest tuna possible and he would help I'm them. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Oh, no, that's all right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. Let's pretend I'm a big white shark. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was a photo that Wayne Davis, our spotter pilot, took of a predation on a gray seal by a gray white shark right off of shore. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember what year this happened. I believe it was 2017. But he would usually catch about an average of four predations on film every year. Um, you kind of have to think of the odds of being in that precise moment where the shark gets the seal are incredibly low. So it's amazing to have photos like this. Okay, 
Okay, so this is another photo taken by him. And before we get into the research that's being done on these sharks, um, this is just, I wanted to use this aerial photo to show you where these sharks are swimming. We said earlier that there are all these different species of sharks in New England, but most of them are pelagic, so they're offshore. The reason the great white shark is so much more visible than any of these other shark species is because it's swimming close to shore in about five to 10 feet of water. Um, Cape Cod is essentially just a large sand bank that goes on for miles. And at low tide, it can get in pretty close to shore. At high tide, it can get in even closer. And the way the seals, the gray seals travel from haul out to haul out, is they travel right in the breakers because there's a little deep drop off right there. And they pop their heads up above the water every after every time they dive and they look for great white sharks. And if they see a shark or a boat or anything in the area, they can very quickly remove themselves and go onto the beach. As a result though, because the seals are here, the sharks are here. So the sharks are going to patrol where the seals are swimming. And you can see that is right next to shore. And essentially on the outer cape, um, it's one long beach, and it's one long, very populated beach. Um, and from Monomoy down at the bottom, all the way up to Provincetown, you have large haulouts of seals that are constantly traveling back and forth right within the breakers. So who else is traveling back and forth <laughs> right by the breakers? <laughs> people also, and it's amazing because a lot of people that it's very cute and fun to swim with those seals. Those seals, especially the males, are incredibly aggressive and have huge, very sharp teeth that they use to tear apart fish. So it actually is more dangerous to be swimming with those seals than it is to be swimming in the water with those great white sharks. So just remember how close this photo shows you. This is basically we would be tagging these great white sharks probably 10 to 20 feet offshore. And you can see why. So when you have a brand new population re-emerging that you don't know anything about, there are two basic questions that you want to focus on. You want to focus on how many of these sharks are out there and where <laughs> are these sharks going? And these are just the most basic questions you can ask but we don't have any answers for them. And there's actually no known population estimate for great white sharks or most sharks anywhere in the world. And that's simply because it's so hard to find them. It's so hard to count them, to find them in the middle of the ocean. And so it's quite likely that almost 90% of all shark species are endangered or critically endangered, but we can't legally label something as critically endangered and give it protection because we don't have the numbers to back up that information. So by the time we find out how many great white sharks are in our area, it's probably about the same time we figure out that they are critically endangered too. Um, so with those two questions that you want to ask, you try to figure out where they are going and how many. So all of these great white sharks are getting tagged with acoustic tags. You can see in the upper left hand corner. And those tags get darted in right by the dorsal fin with a very long pole. And then any time a great white shark swims within 300 meters of the buoy seen here, and these buoys are all between Block Island up to New Brunswick, but mostly populated around Cape Cod, um, it will get logged in for what shark was there and what time. And when you upload all the data, essentially you get a full scale um, data download of where these sharks were and where they were traveling. And from that information, you can figure out where these great white sharks like to hang out. And of course, you find out that these sharks like to hang out where the seals are hanging out. Makes a little bit of sense. And then also, there's an app called Sharktivity, which is run by the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy that tries to do a real, as close to real-time updates as they can, that sharks were either spotted by surfers, swimmers, fishermen, or researchers. Um, and this is just showing you all of the shark sightings that happened. I think this was just like a one week. And you can see that almost all of the shark sightings were happening on the outer cape, so essentially between Monomoy up to P-Town. And then to the left, 
that almost all of those shark detections were happening between Chatham and Orleans. And this is important information to remember um, where we talk about some of the first shark attacks that happened in the next coming slides. But uh, very quickly, if you were to simply glance at these, what could you deduce about where you might not want to swim? <laughs> Perhaps around Chatham, Orleans, that part of the Outer Cape, maybe even anywhere waist deep and deeper on the Outer Cape. You can see that they go in the bay and they even go all the way up to Canada. So Dr. Grace Fomo is actually partnered with um, Canadian Division of Fisheries and they're tagging and following them all the way up to Canada too. And the thing about this is that these sharks are traveling where the seals are. So if you're anywhere in New England or anywhere in that southern part of Canada and you can see some seals in the water, there's probably a shark close by. So a lot of people will say, oh, I've never seen a shark. I've never been swimming with one. If you've been swimming anywhere in New England, you have been swimming with a great white shark. I have seen you. I'm never but, leaving for long again. But through 450 million years of evolution, they can very easily tell the difference between a human and an incredibly fat, lard-filled gray seal. So they rarely make mistakes. Um, what are the sharks eating? I mean, the seals eating. The seals eat fish, but usually sand lances. Uh, so a lot of fish that um, live like in the sand and right on the bottom of the ocean, essentially there. Um, they don't normally go for the same fish that are being fished by the fishermen. But the thing is, is that if there's a fish that's already caught or tangled in a net, kind of an easy lunch, they're going to go after it. So that's why back when they allowed seal mounties, those fishermen would stand on the back of the boats with a shotgun and they would just blow away the seals to try to keep them away from the fish. If they really want to make sure they don't make competition for the fish though, then they'll protect the great white sharks because the great white sharks will naturally keep the population of the seals down. So this is a picture that was taken by um, Brian Scary, who does photographs for National Geographic. And this is what the tagging process of the great white shark looks like. So we have Wayne Davis, our aerial spotter, flying up and down the coast of Cape Cod looking for sharks. And the reason we have to use an aerial spotter is because there's no chumming allowed within Massachusetts state waters. So that's zero to three miles offshore. That is a very wonderful thing because then if we were chumming to attract these sharks, we would also be changing their behavior, but when the first shark attack happened, we would also be blamed for bringing the sharks in, not the seals. Mm -hmm. So because we don't use any chumming and we're finding these sharks essentially in their natural, their natural swimming behavior, um, we cannot be blamed for bringing these sharks here when in real life everyone knows the sharks are here because of the seals. But Wayne Davis, our earlier spotter, will fly up and down. Uh, he has a window in his airplane, then he leans over and he looks for sharks, and that's as simple as it is. And then he gives radio coordinates uh, to us in the boat, um, that is Dr. Greg Skomal right in the pulpit, of where the shark is. And what's really interesting is that this is a very clear picture of where the shark is. The water is very calm, there is no wind, there's a lot of cloud cover. There have been many, many, many times when we have been on the boat and within a 20 foot radius of us were four different great white sharks. We have no clue until Wayne would call down on the radio and tell us. And that is because the water is not clear in Cape Cod. If there's any kind of wind rippling the surface, you can't see it. And unlike what Jaws might have told you, sharks do not swim around with their dorsal fin out of the water. <laughs> if they were, it would be incredibly easy for the seals to spot them and stay away. So they always want to swim below the surface. And there's also a reason why there's no real cage diving operations in Cape Cod is because there's only about five feet of visibility underwater. So you really cannot see these animals until someone up high points them out or until they swim right past your boat. So this is a long painting pole that has a GoPro attached to it. And what Greg is doing here is he's gonna swipe that GoPro down the left side and down the right side of the shark. 
That footage then goes back to the lab and is used to help identify the shark. So you're looking at defining characteristics like scars, coloration. You need to see if it's male or a female because a pregnant shark will go on a different migration route than a male shark. Um, there's different length estimates, all that kind of stuff. And once he for sure has both sides of the shark identified, he then switches out that GoPro for that acoustic tag that you saw a picture of. And he simply harpoons it right in next to the dorsal fin. And then puts the GoPro camera back on to just get an idea of the placement and how deep it went. Sharks don't have scales, they have skin. And their skin is incredibly rough and thick. So it's kind of just like getting an ear pierced or something like that, and clearly we don't have a great idea of what kind of pain they're in if any, but for a lot of sharks, it actually doesn't even bother them at all when they get that little tag put in. You have to make sure that the tag is going deep enough, though, to actually stay there so it doesn't fall off 45 minutes later. Can I ask a question? Of course. So, so the, to do that with a shark, I mean, they're not really afraid of the boat or afraid so of the So some are. So what we found is that smaller sharks, so probably in the juvenile age of about seven feet to 10 feet, are very skittish around the boat. <laughs> and then you get from 11 feet up to 17 feet. Mm -hmm. And they're incredibly aware that they are the apex predators mm -hmm. in the ocean. And they just swim slowly, nothing bothers them, and they're wonderful to work with. Um, but it also changes shark to shark. Each great white shark has a very different personality, which I think is the most interesting thing from studying these animals. But that's even assuming that the weather is nice. So it's not taking into account five foot waves or wind or the shark suddenly turn around. There have been so many times that Greg has been about to tag a shark <coughs> and a wave takes the boat away. So there's also a lot of weather that plays into the field research and also human error too. So the population study, they are utilizing something called a mark recapture. Um, and that actually wrapped up at the end of the field season last year at the end of October. And the way it works is that every shark that you mark or tag in this case, you then, next time you go out, you want to see if you encounter a tagged shark or a brand new shark that hasn't been tagged. If you get to year five and 100% of the sharks that you're encountering have been tagged, <coughs> then you have an exact estimate of what the population is. If you are encountering 50% tagged sharks, 50% untagged sharks, you know the population is doubling the size. And so from those estimates, they can get a rough idea of what the population is like off of New England. Of course, what makes it a little bit harder, this is just in Cape Cod, and we know that these great white sharks do go all the way up to Canada. It's possible there's populations that stay up in Canada and don't really come down to Cape Cod. So it's not a perfect practice, but that's about the best estimate you can get this is what the footage looks like from the GoPro camera. Um, on the lower left, that is a picture of a great white shark that had just taken a bite out of the seal that we were able to get on camera. Um, this one right here has some seaweed stuck in its teeth. <laughs> and essentially what you are using this GoPro footage for is to help you find those identification factors that I mentioned earlier. So you are looking for um, coloration, normally around the gill slits. The reason you don't really look for cuts is because they heal. The coloration, so the pattern of where the black and the white meets on the great white shark, will never change. Scars and cuts and that kind of stuff can actually change and heal very quickly within sharks. So essentially you're looking for either the white and black colorations or large um, disfigurements. So maybe like a fin that is flipped or something like that. And that's to help you identify these sharks. So as of 2017, last year's data has not been analyzed yet. Um, over 170 great white sharks have been identified off of Cape Cod. 
So remember these hot spots that you very clearly learned not to go swimming at just within that one minute. So the next video I'm going to show you is uh, one of the most popular swimming beaches in Cape Cod. It's called Nossip Beach and it's in um, Orleans, right where the circles are around. And it is um, located on a beach where we probably spent 90% of our tiding time. So if that tells you anything. Um, it, clearly does to me and everyone else on the boats. Um, but this is a footage uh, that happened, I think it was in 2017, of a shark that was close to shore that ate a seal that had three surfers right next to it. And it was all caught on camera because there were about 3,000 people on the beach. <laughs> video is just incredible. There was panic on a popular Cape Cod beach today after a shark went on the attack just yards from the shore. You see this here. The shark takes a bite out of a seal and kills it just off Nosset Beach in Orleans. The water there filling with blood. A couple of surfers nearby scrambled to get on shore. As that was happening, the beachgoers rushed to the water's edge. They were actually afraid with all that blood that the shark might have attacked a swimmer. But nobody was hurt there. Nosset Beach was closed down after this. Understandably, shark sightings have closed a number of beaches on the outer cape over the past week. Wow. Perhaps that speaks to the warmer waters and just how close the seals are to shore sometimes. We are going to learn pretty soon whether or not that was a great way. I assume it is based on the way it just took apart that Annihilated seal. Annihilated the seal. Yes. The yes. surfer right off to the right of the seal. <laughs> has he been back in fast as fast as, 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 as he can. I mean, it was, it was a good day to be at the beach, but boy, whew, yeah. not going in above here. Right. Very long. <laughs> So that, as we discussed, was a beach located right in the middle of those red circles of the highest detection rate for all the great white sharks. There's actually a haul out of gray seals above that beach and below. So that means there's constant movement of gray seals right next to shore between those two areas. As a result, we consistently saw between four and five great white sharks right offshore there almost every single day that we were in the area tagging. Um, there are some shark detection programs um, and if they spot a shark or if they spot us in the boat they close the beach for an hour the problem with that is that if we leave the area to go tag a different shark it does not mean those sharks have left the area what i was saying about how hard it is to see these sharks in the water you really cannot see these sharks out there but they can see you you saw how close that seal was to three surfers through 450 million years of evolution, sharks can very, very easily detect a difference between humans and prey. The one problem is that some of their senses, like their ability to, they have a sixth sense that allows them to feel essentially the electrical currents of a beating heart, so a living animal underwater, that only works between two and three feet away from that animal. So if you're in murky water and it knows that there is a living, being there, it can smell it, it can see a blurry image, but the water is murky. The only way to see what it is, because they don't have hands, is to take a bite. <laughs> with an animal with a large mouth, that one bite is usually done in an area where there is a large um, artery or something like that. And a lot of these bites occur in places that do not have actually great access to medical care when you're bleeding that steadily and very quickly. Um, almost 100% of all shark bites that do occur are simply one bite, because that's one bite where the shark sees what you are, and it sees what you're not. And it sees that you are not a seal, so it leaves, however, you are still bleeding. Um, so, the last time great white sharks were in this area in New England in 1912, 1920s, those times, not a lot of people swam. And there was not a lot of marine or water activities that people did. There wasn't as much surfing, there wasn't as much paddle boarding, boogie boarding, swimming, all that kind of stuff. So in essentially the 70 years that the great white sharks were gone from Cape Cod in New England, Humans learn that they love the ocean. They love swimming. Everyone learned how to swim. They love paddleboarding. They love surfing. They love dressing up as seals in dark wetsuits <laughs> and going out and surfing. And by the time those great white 
white sharks came back, they did not get more dangerous. There was suddenly more humans in the water. So statistically, those interactions are more numerous. When I say to people who have never seen a shark before, if you've ever been swimming in the ocean, you've been swimming with a shark before, they're astounded. But the thing is, is that because so many people swim or recreate in our oceans now and off of the coast, statistically there's more overlap with these animals. So especially for us researchers, all we can do is give out the information. You saw those maps of all the detections. There's flags on Cape Cod and around New England that will be raised up if there's been a shark sighted in the waters. We can share our data. We can give you the information. Hey, don't go swimming offshore deeper than you know, your waist. And people still surf and they paddleboard. And so it was only a matter of time that there was going to be a negative shark and human interaction. And unfortunately, that happened last September. So there's actually a lab in Florida that only focuses on shark attacks. And George Burgess travels the world and he does research on where shark attacks have occurred, what kind of shark did them, other factors like salinity, temperature, sunlight, um, cloud cover, all of that kind of stuff. And he was quoted in 2017 as saying about Cape Cod, it's only a matter of time until there is a human and shark interaction, just statistically. Um, because as more research is being done in the area, we know for a fact that there are four to five great white sharks off of Nassau Beach every year. That has not changed the amount of people that show up and swim at Nassau Beach. Um, especially in September and October when, due to climate change, we are having warmer falls. More people are swimming and the lifeguards in Cape Cod stop working on Labor Day. So there is no one to really be raising those flags if there's any sharks in the area. There is a lot of signage around Cape Cod now. Um, recent shark sightings swim at your own risk. So to the left, where the shark attack happened, it was right after Labor Day weekend, I believe, and it was in Wellfleet on the outer coast of Cape Cod. Those are people on the beach looking down at where the shark attack happened, what is the sign that is directly above them there? <laughs> so there's a sign directly above them warning them about sharks, warning them not to go into water deeper than waist deep. Um, unfortunately, the person who was bit by a great white shark was boogie boarding pretty far out. Um, and there were a lot of other surfers and boogie boarders in the water there. Um, this is also in that same red circled area that I showed you before of detections and where the sharks are normally found. Um, he was bit while boogie boarding and due to blood loss, um, unfortunately passed away before you can make it to the Cape Cod Hospital. This did not deter people from a few days later. All 100 plus people going out into that same spot where he was bit and having a memorial for him on their surfboards. <laughs> um, and this was strongly discouraged by Chris by um, everyone in Cape Cod. Um, and the thing is, is that you can give people the information that they need to essentially act intelligently or to take care of themselves and to understand risks. People are going to do what they're going to want to do to begin with. And unfortunately, um, after this happened, there was a nationwide um, discussion of whether we should just go out and kill all of the great white sharks. Oh. And that discussion was actually first brought up in that 2017 video of the great white shark eating the seal that we saw a minute earlier. So there was a Barnstable commissioner who said that we should call all the sharks, which means to kill it. And that was simply after seeing a video of a shark naturally going after its prey. And not just going after its prey, but so selectively going after its prey that there were three surfers right next to it that it wasn't attacking. Um, and the blame for this, although incredibly sad that it did happen statistically, I'm amazed it didn't happen earlier. Um, and that it hasn't happened more often. 
but it is something to remember that even if you are in the Cape Cod area, you, um, the actual statistic, where is it here? So your odds of dying in a shark attack are one in 3.7 million. <laughs> That's very low. But if you go boogie boarding or surfing or swimming in an area where these apex predators are known to frequent, and you do so against the advice of all researchers in the area, that raises it much, much higher. And another statistic, which is a little bit more applicable to Vermont, is that cows are responsible for 20 times more deaths than sharks. So that's something to keep in mind too when it comes to that. So why should this resurgence of great white sharks in New England, why should we celebrate it and why should we not join the crowds of people saying, I want my ocean in Cape Cod to be like a swimming pool and I want all the predators taken out. Um, and the reason that is, so this is another photo by Wayne Davis, and this is a photo that he actually took of a friend of his who was on the paddleboard. This great white shark came nowhere close to this paddleboard, and this is what 99.9% .9 of all interactions of great white sharks and humans are like in New England. These are in the water, they are not interested in humans, but if we continue to bring our paddle boards and our surfboards out there, you're going to have the overlap that you can see in this picture here. So what I think is amazing about sharks is that they have been around for 450 million years. They have survived five mass extinctions. So what drove away the dinosaurs, what drove away the mammoths, everything else, these sharks survived. And the way that a lot of these shark species survived is actually by diving deeper into the ocean. So unlike on land, where you have different apex predators, you have lions, you have bears, you have wolves, you have, um, I mean, in some places you have anacondas, you have kind of a wide variety of terrestrial animals that could be apex predators. In the ocean, no matter what ecosystem you're in, from hydrothermal vents in the deepest part of the ocean to the coldest water around the Arctic, you have a shark species that is the apex predator there. Um, and what's really amazing about that is that they have had so long to adapt perfectly to every single part of the ocean that they are found in. And the thing about apex predators is that there's something called a trophic cascade. So an apex predator is something that's gonna be at the top of a food chain. And if you take away the top predator, so if you kill them off, what is below them, so in this case seals with the great white sharks, are going to overpopulate. What the seals eat, so fish or some kind of sand lances, will then almost go extinct and then what they eat as a return will overpopulate. So that's called a trophic cascade. So in every single level of the eating or food chain, there's gonna be disruption, whether it's overpopulation or almost extinction. And with great white sharks at the top of a food chain, they are the anchor for everything. And all these other shark species, like the seven gill shark, the Greenland shark, which was just recently found to be over 250 years old, one of the oldest living animals in the world. And they found that out by actually carbon dating the corneas of the Greenland sharks. It's estimated they can live up to 500 years in age. And they think some of that, though, is because they live in such cold waters, they age so slowly. So, Recommendation to swim in cold waters. <laughs> but these apex predators are exactly why it should be celebrated that we, for the first time since people started killing off uh, the seals in early 19th century, this one was the first time that we have seen a healthy marine ecosystem in New England waters in more than 100 years. You have the apex predator that will in turn keep in check the gray seals. Um, people who are specifically fishermen who are complaining about too many gray seals, well the way you help that is you help protect the great white sharks, which will naturally keep that population in check. As a result, by keeping that population in check, they won't overeat any of the fish that the fishermen are targeting. So for a very long time, we did not have a healthy marine ecosystem. 
And the reason fishermen are actually complaining about why it's harder and harder to fish is not because of seals, it's because the way we fish has gotten more and more and more advanced through fish finders, through commercial fishing, through all of that, they are the ones who are removing the fish from the sea, not the gray seals. Um, so this matters to us in New England and specifically in Vermont, simply because a healthy marine ecosystem benefits everyone. Uh, we get 50% of our air supply from the ocean and we have, I mean, any marine seafood that we're eating in Vermont did not come from here. So we need to be celebrating the fact that there's actually healthy marine ecosystems that we can hopefully utilize in a sustainable manner. Um, one in nine jobs in the United States is actually um, connected to the ocean. So if we have a healthy ocean, then hopefully we can have a healthy economy when it comes to that. So even being in Vermont, it does matter that these great white sharks are here in New England. And it is something that could ultimately, and is already ultimately benefiting us. Um, if you want to swim in an ocean that is devoid of predators, that's what pools are for. <laughs> and you can also go and swim in places where these sharks are not found. There's a lot of information now due to advances in research where we know these sharks aren't. We know they are in some places, we know that they aren't. Um, a lot of them undertake the same migration route as other people in this room. And they spend their summers in Cape Cod and they winter down in South Carolina and Florida. So right now is a great time to go swimming in Cape Cod. <laughs> Not a great time to go swimming on the Hilton Head. That is where all of these great white sharks are right now. Um, but just because they essentially are a threat to us does not mean that we have the right to take them out of the ocean. Um, what I think is the most amazing thing when I spend my time diving with great white sharks or any sharks in general is that it puts me back into the food chain um, because it's something that humans have gotten very good about removing ourselves from and we are just as interconnected as any of the other animals here and we are not at the top naturally. So it gives you a level of respect for these animals and it connects you back to the earth in a way that I think we have kind of disconnected ourselves in the last century. Um, I think that's the last slide. Mm. One other thing we can celebrate is that there's actually only five hotspots in the world where these great white sharks are. Um, they spend most of their time very, very far out to sea. And I think it's incredibly cool that Cape Cod and the Northwest Atlantic is now a great white shark hotspot. Um, these beautiful animals are rarely seen because they try to stay as far away as possible from humans. But they do come to shore to feed on certain animals like seals and sea lions. Um, so in Stewart Island, Stewart Island, New Zealand, Neptune Islands, Australia, South Africa, California and Guadalupe up to the Farallon Islands off of San Francisco, and now Cape Cod and Northwest Atlantic. We are home to one of the most beautiful predators ever made in 450 million years, and I think that's something to be celebrated instead of um, shying away from the fact or using it kind of as a fear topic. Mm -hmm. Thank and this is the last slide and it's to leave you with um two quotes the one closest to me is by peter benchley the creator and writer of jaws who became <coughs> one of the largest shark conservation advocates in the world and his wife who i met a few years ago Wendy benchley has continued on with his work and now offers a lot of grants to shark researchers around the world um, but what he said is without sharks you take away the apex predator of the ocean and you destroy the entire food chain. So this is the trophic cascade that we were just talking about. And then Sylvia Earle, who was one of the first female marine biologists and then also shark biologists in the world, um, you should be afraid if you are in the ocean and you don't see sharks. There are a lot of places where 20, 30 years ago there used to be a lot more shark species down the Caribbean, off of Florida, in the Keys. They're no longer there anymore, and it's because of all this destruction to coral reefs <coughs> and human interference with dredging, cutting down mangroves, pollution. And you should be more concerned where you are swimming in an area where there should be sharks and you aren't seeing them. 
because it's not a positive thing. It's a negative sign of what we are doing to the oceans that will continue to essentially steamroll. Um, where I spend a lot of my time in Fiji doing work, it's because it is a third world, world country, so it has such healthy coral reefs there. We essentially haven't destroyed them yet. And where I work in Fiji, I swim on a daily basis with eight different shark species. And there's almost nowhere else in the world that you can do that. Um, and so it's amazing that you have to go that far away from the United States to get such a healthy marine ecosystem. Um, so just another reason why we should be celebrating the return of these great white sharks. And the thing is, is that along with the return of these great white sharks, just like the return of the salmon to certain rivers, we might start seeing positive effects that we didn't even know could be a positive effect. So the returning of these great white sharks could start causing seabirds that we haven't seen in a very long time return to the area to feed on healthy populations of fish. You know, it, certain seagrasses grow in areas. It's just, it's all so interconnected that it's possible we don't even know the extent of how positive um, this ecosystem will flourish with the great white sharks back in this area. So I would love to answer any questions. It doesn't have to be about great white sharks that you might, <laughs> that you might have. Yes? I was just wondering in the example of you being on the boat and there being four white, great white sharks around you, um, could you use like fish finder or radar or something? <laughs> So you can't simply because we're usually in like six feet of water. Um, and the fish finder that they use is mostly to go offshore to the banks where they find those like large tuna and the large schools. Um, but really you just feel like a complete idiot because there's five 15 foot sharks swimming around your boat and you have no clue. And that's when you realize just kind of how um, attuned sharks are with their six senses and their ability to sense stuff like that and how not attuned we are. Yes. Does the uh, fact that we're putting more and more plastics into the ocean adversely affect the white shark? It affects everything. Um, especially when you hear stories about <coughs> these whales and seals and birds dying and coming up on shore and their stomachs are filled with plastic. That's what sharks are feeding on. So besides the fact that to a certain degree, it's just really not environmentally stable to be eating almost any fish right now, you are ingesting more and more plastic the higher you go up the food chain. Because those things that are at the top of the food chain, like sharks and swordfish, they're eating all of those little fish that are already filled with plastic. So by the time you eat swordfish, it's called bioaccumulation. There's a larger and larger quantity of plastic, but also mercury and any other pollution like that. Mm -hmm. Related, uh, you keep using the word healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like that's possible. So with humans, we make it very hard for things like that to happen. Um, because it is incredibly hard for us to not interject ourselves. Um, the reason this population and this ecosystem became unbalanced to begin with is because we systematically killed off the gray seals. Um, and that was for the fur or for the fish. Um, it is hard and now because of that, because we throw this ecosystem out of whack, there are now so many seals because they are protected. So that's why there are a lot of fishermen in Cape Cod who are saying, well, now we need to kill off all these seals. You don't, you just need to protect their predator that's here. Because the thing is, is that the, our ecosystems, whether it's on land or in the water, have a natural way of keeping themselves in balance without any human interaction. <laughs> and they will find a sustainable number that what that ecosystem can handle. So if we just keep our hands off of New England in the waters there, the shark population will continue to flourish and will take down the seal population naturally. And eventually it will get to the number where the population has peaked in New England for great white sharks and for seals, and then all the other animals beneath them. And from there, everything will be kept naturally in a balance. As humans, from hunting, from commercial fishing, from all that kind of stuff, we take too much in we throw everything out of whack very easily. I was happy to see your map of the world showing 
where the white sharks were and where they weren't. Because I've been places where sharks are safe to swim with. In the Galapagos with white tipped sharks yes. and other species. And we only yeah. think of sharks as killers of people. And that's not true. Yeah. They're, they're part of all of the oceanic ecosystems. So there are over 500 different species of sharks. The only sharks that are ever responsible for any kind of human um, interactions or bites, there's about six species. So that leaves 493 sharks that want nothing to do with us. And a lot of those instances, like for oceanic white tips, it's actually come in the last century from um, large ships with Navy sailors crashing and them eating the injured or dead people. Um, so that kind of instance. It's, I mean, the last time a person was bit by a great white shark in Cape Cod was 1936. So it was almost 80 years since the last time there was a human white shark interaction. Um, who knows if those numbers will go up? I believe that number will go up just simply because we have this wealth of information that people are not actually changing their behavior to. So we know more about where these sharks are and where they're going, and yet people are not really taking that into account when they're planning how far out they're swimming. Um, I think it's incredibly important that with the wealth of information that we can get now that you integrate that information into your behavior. Yes. I understand that one of the big mysteries with great whites has been not knowing where their nurseries are, not yeah. knowing where they have their babies and and is there progress on that? Maybe you should keep that secret or <laughs> so unfortunately it's, it was discovered about thirty years ago and it's off of Montauk. Um, so there's a great white shark baby birthing ground there. And then, and yep, they're about this big when they're born. Um, and on the west coast, it's off of Long Beach, California. And is it very deep and far out? Is that why they It's pretty shallow, or, unfortunately. Because um, they don't want those baby sharks, even though when sharks are born, they come out fully formed because there's no parental care. So essentially, from the moment they're born, they have to take care of themselves and be able to look for food and that's why mangroves are very important because they act as nurseries for a lot of sharks but these sharks in a um, Montauk area they can very easily get cooked by fishermen and that kind of stuff and the reason they birth them around Montauk is because they don't want to give birth to them deep out in the middle of the ocean where there's other large sharks um, so it's trying to keep them as safe as possible there. But unfortunately, um, we do know where <laughs> their birthing grounds are. And so it's one of those things. Um, and that's also a problem that has come up sometimes with these live trackers that we have on some of our more expensive tags, where you in real time can see where these sharks are. It does cause some people, not the best people in the world, um, to go out and try to find these sharks and hook them. So. You know, there's the problem with research and science is that there's always someone who will take advantage of it in a negative yeah. way, but you can't focus your research on those idiots out there. You have to, you know, for the majority of the people, this is it's a benefit to know where these birthing grounds are and where these sharks are. <coughs> yes. is, is there a fine for that? I mean, is there, is there the deterrent? So in California, it is illegal. Uh, I think it's a $10,000 fine to, um, to catch a great white shark off the beach. That does not stop people from doing it because the thing about fishing is that it is completely indiscriminate. So it's not like on their hook out there, there's a sign that says, any animal but a great white shark, bite this. Um, so a lot of people can go out and fish off of California and say they're trying to not catch great white sharks but they are actually purposely trying to catch great white sharks. It's just kind of a he said, she said kind of scenario. Um, there are no federal laws against catching great white sharks yet, but for state waters, um, Florida has protected some shark species like hammerheads, but that still doesn't, we know that 90% of them die after being handled, so that doesn't stop people from still catching them and possibly killing them from just dragging them on a beach and taking a photo. 
Um, and also, fish and wildlife does not always have the funds or the manner to really be policing or enforcing um, some of these rules and regulations. And the thing is, is that you can make all the protection and conservation laws that you want, but unless there's someone who can actually enforce them, it's not going to make a difference. Is that done in Massachusetts where there are so Massachusetts violent? not yet. Well, so you can't, besides spiny dogfish, you can't um, commercially fish for any shark, and it is frowned upon um, to catch any other sharks. That doesn't stop people from catching like thrushers and makos and, and blue sharks, but you do have to go, um, you know, like 20, 30 miles offshore before you even find those sharks. So, but the, a lot of these sharks, the great white sharks, are also in the deep ocean. You said pelagic is a definition of yep, of deep water. So, so it just happens that because of the seals, they are close to shore. But they're normally the b bigger population is just. <coughs> deep so water it's called the, um, the hard part with trying to protect any kind of marine animal is that clearly you cannot just protect the whole ocean. So what you have to find out are these critical hot spots. So where do these animals feed? Where do they breed? Uh, where do they give birth and mate? All of that kind of stuff. And so these white sharks do tend to stay pretty far offshore, but they come in from June through now almost October, November because of warming waters to feed on those seals. And that's not not every shark, um, you know, and they're essentially from Monomoy all the way up to Canada, so it's a pretty big distance. But then in when the water starts to cool down, they go further offshore and they go south. So they do spend a lot of time, but they are not completely pelagic like those blue sharks and makos that never come close to shore. And that's simply because their prey is seals, sea lions, whales, that kind of stuff. Yes. What's the relationship between the people of Fiji and the sharks? So it's really interesting. Um, Fijian folklore has a shark god, um, and that has actually been a, a great benefit when it comes to protecting these sharks. The one thing is, is that in the last 20 years, ecotourism has really started to provide them with more money than it would provide if they were culling the sharks and selling the fins to Hong Kong. So, Ecotourism, or specifically diving and diving with sharks in Fiji, brings about $20 million now. So if they protect one shark, they can bring in $100 just for that one shark almost every day for 20, 30 years. If they kill that one shark, the fins will bring in $500 once. So you can only protect something if you have incentive to protect it. So by protecting these sharks in Fiji, their economy will actually be, you know, flourish, which is why Fiji has turned into such a wonderful hotspot when it comes to protecting the sharks, diving with the sharks. Um, it's the same in the Bahamas and uh, Galapagos, Cocos Islands, um, Philippines, some areas, they're finally learning that it is actually better off and they will make more money if they protect these animals instead of killing them. <clears throat> but the people who are responsible for killing these sharks, they're poor fishermen who have no other way to make money. They're not these awful people. They're simply trying to provide for their families. So uh, in Fiji, where I work, um, when you pay to dive on this reef with the sharks, a levy of that money goes to the village who's protecting that. So essentially, every single person in that village benefits by protecting those sharks. <clears throat> that if you can't enforce uh, a, a law, it, it's kind of a moot point. But yes. are there any sanctuaries, marine sanctuaries, off the East Coast, like, say, the Farallones or Monterey Bay? Off the, the West Coast? coast? On, on the West Coast. But are there yeah. any marine sanctuaries on the East Coast at all? So I believe it was last year that they declared a marine sanctuary very far off in... Um, uh, Saint, like St. George's Banks area. I, it's not a shark-specific sanctuary, but it is a protected. Um, so the United States has zero to 200 miles offshore that it can protect um, resource 
natural resource wise. Um, and I do believe that was declared a national monument. I don't know exactly how that is different than a sanctuary, but that area was declared a, a monument. Um, the thing is, is in U.S. waters, you, besides the spiny dogfish, you cannot commercially fish any sharks. Um, but there are a lot of other countries in the world that have shark sanctuaries and um, marine protected parks and national parks, just like in Fiji, where they are federally protected. Yes. So we do have nine right. marine sanctuaries in the U.S., and one of them is right off of this area, Stella Walk and Bay. Yes, thank the, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, and yeah, also for the right whales and everything. 15 yeah. miles uh, offshore. That beautiful. area that you just mentioned is because of noise pollution, part of it, so the ships have moved away. Does that yes. affect the shark, too, like it does the whales? So it doesn't, and that's simply because for whales, the noise pollution affects directly their echolocation and their ability to communicate together. Sharks do not communicate. Um, visually, they communicate with body language, and they have 50 times uh, better hearing than humans do. And um, but they don't make any noises underwater, so they really don't have any need to echo locate or anything like that. Um, and that hearing is usually used to hear if there's any kind of splashing at the surface, but also they can feel vibration-wise along the sides of their bodies, too. Yes? There, I know you had a question. I was just wondering if uh, the, the media performance of Shark Week has that helped or hindered um, the reputation of sharks? I would say it is both. Um, it has drastically improved over the years with a more of a focus being given to actual science and actual research. Um, but it also is up to the scientists and the, research, the researchers who are asked to be involved to make sure that their shows are kept on track and are not just stunts or anything like that. Um, it, there's two different ways that you can make change. You can actually be in the show and make sure that it's focusing on research and science, or you can turn down shows that are being offered to you that are simply stunts. The thing is, is that Shark Week is mostly for people who really want to see extreme footage of sharks feeding or aerial breaching like great white sharks, um, people doing stupid things to sharks. It's not necessarily an education standpoint, but every year there are more and more shows that are focusing on research and science and not just stunts and air jaws and that kind of stuff. Yes. Actually, a comment, not a question. I think the best way for conservation is what you're doing. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you'd rather be in the water, but. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So a big part of being a shark biologist, which is not something you have to do if you are studying whales, dolphins, turtles, people love those animals. A big part of being a shark biologist is not just the research that you're doing, but also helping people understand why they should care also and also breaking apart any myths or misconceptions that are put out there from Shark Week, from Jaws, from Sharknado, anything like that. Um, and it's a very rare occurrence. There really aren't any other animals, maybe large snakes or crocodiles, that you have to do something like that to. You sh I think it's, a, when people ask me why sharks, for me the answer is, why is not everyone out there studying sharks? Because I think they're amazing. I think they're beautiful, they're amazing, and if you had an option to go out and study these beautiful animals, why isn't everyone doing it? So. Let's do one more question, and then we'll all go to the Cape to swim. <laughs> <laughs> one last question? Did I scare you? No. <laughs> Lindsay did. Lindsay did. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. For